Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for the love and the joy we have coming together to sit around the table of the Lord and take of this wonderful spiritual meal that will give us strength, energy, and prepare us so that, Lord, whenever you will come, we'll be ready for that hour and that moment in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, tonight, as we come before you, that your spirit will take this word of truth and you apply it to every heart and every life in Jesus' name, that you so prepare us by the teaching of the word, instructing us, inspiring us, and influencing us so that, Lord, we'll be able to take this word and go and tell our neighbors what is coming ahead so that they too will be prepared as we are preparing in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that whatever is difficult in the world that many people do not readily understand, you grant us understanding. Give us a key, Lord, that you'll open this door and everyone will see great, wonderful things out of your truth. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Before you say down another amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see that. We're coming back to you. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Already we have studied verse 1 all through to verse 19. And you remember that Daniel prayed. He was praying for the nation. He was praying because he had seen the very things that God had said concerning the captivity that will come for the people of Judah. And the people of Jerusalem, the city. And that had happened already. But Jeremiah had given the prophecy that after 70 years, the captivity of Judah will be reversed. And he will be released to come back to their land. And now that 70 years were approaching, Daniel then found it necessary that he will pray, call upon the Lord. It was a prayer of intercession. Calling the Lord that the Lord will give intervention. And he himself will pray in the prayer of intercession that God will grant the whole of the nation intervention. He then identified with the whole nation as he prayed. And now we come to verse 20. He said, and while I was praying, I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people, of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication, before the Lord my God, the hope for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, that means yes, really, truly. Whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man angel, that's an, that's an angel, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, because to fly swiftly, touched me at about the time of the evening oblation. Here we find that as Daniel was praying, the Lord answered immediately. That means that God was fulfilling his promise. He had given the promise to every one of us. Why don't you look at that in Isaiah chapter 65. And it was fulfilled in Daniel's case. I pray it will be fulfilled in your life too. Uh, Isaiah chapter 65 verse 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call... I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. By the way, you notice the words there, they. It says, before they call, I will answer. And it says, while they are yet speaking, I will hear. That means the promise is not just for Daniel. It's for you and it's for me. That if we pray like Daniel prayed, then we're sure that he'll give us the answer. He'll give us the response speedily. By the way, how did he pray? He prayed, number one, according to the will of God. Because it had been written in the scriptures that this will be the time of the captivity of the children of Israel. And because he studied the word, and he allied his prayer to the word. That's the reason why God answered speedily. Not only that, he prayed according to what God had promised. 
Because God had promised this and he said, Lord, this is what you said. Just do as you have said. And that's the great way to pray. The best way to pray. That you will just look at the word of God. And then you will tell God in your prayer. Oh Lord, I'm not praying out of my own will or my own desire, my own decision. All I'm asking is do as you have said. Second Samuel chapter 7. In Second Samuel chapter 7, we're looking at verse 25. Here David was praying. And here he teaches us also how to pray. It says in Second Samuel seven twenty-five, and now, O Lord God, the word that Thou hast spoken concerning Thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever, and do as Thou hast said. That's how to pray. And Daniel was praying in that same way he had read in Jeremiah. And because of what he read, he just came to the Lord and said, Lord, what you have spoken concerning Judah, what you have spoken concerning your people, do as thou hast said. He was counting on the faithfulness of God. And that we can count upon whenever we're praying. Number one, you know the word of God, you are praying according to that word. Number two, you know the will of God, you are praying according to that will. And then you know that God is a covenant-keeping God, and you are telling the Lord, you cannot fail, you're a faithful God, and we're counting on your faithfulness, therefore do as you have said. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're looking at verse 23. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. When you are praying, pray like Daniel and hold fast the profession, the confession of your faith. You look at the end of that verse. For he is faithful that promise. That's what helped him and that's why he got an answer that he got speedily, immediately. They were told at the beginning of their supplication, that's what the angel said, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee. The Lord was so well pleased with Daniel that at the very time that, they began, that he began the prayer, even before he began much pleading, the angel was sent with haste to deliver the answer. Now you learn something about Daniel. We're back to Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading now from verse 22. And he informed me, and he talked with me, and said to Daniel, I am now come for to give this skill and understanding. Look at verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I'm come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Mark that in your Bible. It says, the reason why you are having the prayer, yes, you are praying according to the will of God. Yes, you are praying according to the words of prophecy. And yes, you are depending and counting upon the faithfulness of God. Much more than that, there's a personal reason. And the personal reason is, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. If you want God to respond to you very quickly and very swiftly, you must make sure that you have a relationship with the Lord. How do you have that? You are born again. You are a child of God. You are not an enemy of God. You are not a servant of Satan. And you are not a friend of the world. You love God. You have repented of your sin. You have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has taken away your sin. And the Spirit of God has borne witness in your heart. You are a child of God. Not just an ordinary child of God. You are walking step after step. And you are walking close unto the Lord. It is that daily walk in obedience to the word of God that makes you beloved. By the way, it's not just uh, Daniel alone that was greatly beloved. We read in the scriptures other people that were greatly beloved. But unfortunately, some of them did not keep that special intimacy and that special affection. They were greatly beloved before, but something happened to them. They allowed something to come in between them and God. And they were no more greatly beloved. 
I'm showing you that in the scriptures now in Nehemiah chapter 13. And the reason I'm showing you that is so that you will not have the erroneous idea. Once you are a child of God, you're always a child of God. And once you are greatly beloved, you're always greatly beloved. When once God has put his affection upon you. And he says, of course I love you. You are the beloved of the Lord. You must keep that. And keep intimate with the Lord. Otherwise, if you go back into what you led before, although you were formerly greatly beloved, you might not be greatly beloved. Again, in Nehemiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 26. It says, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God. That's what we read about Solomon. In the past, he said he was. He was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Then it says, nevertheless, anytime you see that in the scriptures, it means something negative is being said now. Something different is being said now. Something opposite to what you had before is not being said. He was greatly beloved of the Lord. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin that then made him to fall from that position of being a real child of God, a true child of God, a beloved child of God. He was no more greatly beloved. Look at Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. If you are a child of God, keep walking with God. If you are a child of God, keep obeying the Lord. If you are a child of God, keep in righteousness and holiness. If the Lord is telling you, I love you, I appreciate you, you are a greatly beloved child of God like Daniel, keep at it so that you will not break that and lose the privilege of being greatly beloved of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 15. Jeremiah 11, verse 15. Watch as my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she has wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. You see here, the Lord was saying, yes, they were greatly beloved. I don't even want to see them again. I don't want to see them in my sight. Why? Because they practiced evil, abomination, iniquity, transgression, sin. And it says, when they did evil, they even smiled at that. They rejoiced at that. And they took pleasure in doing evil. It says, that's why although they were beloved before, they are no more beloved again. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 7. I have forsaken mine house. I have led my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Can you see that then? The Lord is teaching us by his word. That why a child of God before doesn't mean you'll continue to be a child of God if you don't keep on believing the Lord, obeying the Lord, following the Lord, walking according to the word of the Lord. That you are greatly beloved in the past, like Daniel. And so you are rejoicing. God always answers my prayer. God is with me all the time. And God is blessing me. And he's giving me assurance I'm a greatly beloved of the Lord. Then you keep with the Lord, because otherwise, it says in that Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 7, I have even given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hands of the enemies because of their sin. We thank God for Daniel. He knew the Lord as a teenager, as a youth. And yet, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 70 years passed and more than that. And he still remained a child of God. That same grace available to Daniel is available for you and for me. We can remain in the Lord. We can abide in the Lord. And as we have been greatly beloved, we will continue to be greatly beloved in Jesus' name. I thought you will say Amen. amen. Though God loves all his children, yet there are some that are more greatly beloved than the rest. Christ had one disciple that lay in his bosom. That's John the Beloved. And the same thing you can say about John was saying about Daniel. Daniel remained greatly beloved and John the Beloved remained greatly beloved. They did not allow the temptation of the hour, the trials of the time, the troubles of the day to make them go away from the Lord. They remained 
remain with the Lord. Daniel in the Old Testament and John the Beloved in the New Testament, they remain greatly beloved until they left this world. Now they are in heaven with the Lord and they are still greatly beloved. And then you'll find out something. Daniel, the greatly beloved, in the Old Testament, the Lord gave him revelations and visions concerning the end of time. And the same thing the Lord has done through John, John the Beloved, because of that beloved relationship, affection, then the Lord also gave him that great revelation. And if we are the same of the Lord, walking closely with the Lord, he'll not leave us in darkness, he'll give us skill and understanding, and then we'll be having understanding of the revelations of the Lord as well. As we come to the study tonight, we're dividing the study to three parts. The study is God's program for his people through the Messiah. The Messiah is Christ. The Messiah is our Savior. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're looking at God's program for the people of God, for Israel and the whole church, even through that Christ, the Messiah, Lord and Savior. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, Advent and dispensation of Messiah the Prince. The coming of that Prince. And the at the dispensation of that Messiah, the Prince. Number two, atonement through the death of Messiah, the Prince. Atonement through the death of Messiah, the Prince. Then number three, the abomination of desolation by the monster Prince. That's, that is, by the Antichrist. We're coming to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people people and upon thy holy city. You remember what you have read already from verse 20 to verse 23. Daniel had been praying. He wanted to know how God will deal with the children of Israel, the people of Judah and of Jerusalem, the capital city at this time. And now the angel came and began to show Daniel not just what will happen immediately after the Babylonian captivity, but he showed him what will happen way beyond, way beyond the time of the Babylonian captivity. Isn't that something wonderful that he was praying for something small, something brief, something of the moment, something of the present time, and God said, Daniel, you're too important to heaven for me to just limit my revelation to you concerning things present, things at hand. I'm going to show you things way, way ahead of you. And so now the angel began to say, it's not just the Babylonian captivity I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with the whole program of the Almighty God from the time now until the time of the Antichrist. Think about that. The time of the Antichrist, that even goes beyond the time of the rapture. That God said, I'm going to reveal everything to you. Verse 24 again, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince shall be seven, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood unto and unto the edge of the world. Desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation and on, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. 
Now, as we look at this, we will learn something very important. I want you to look at verse 24 again. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Brothers and sisters, the uh, history of the world is not in the hand of Satan. It's in the hands of God. The angel came and he said, everything depends on God. Seventy weeks are determined. Determined by God. Determined by heaven. Determined in the mind of God. And it's only what God has determined that has been pledged out. He does that for the whole world. He does that for every nation. And he does that for every believer. And you want to understand that there are things that are determined in your life. Determined by God. Determined by heaven. And uh, you don't want to concentrate on the enemies, on the Babylonians, on the Middle Persians, on the Grecian uh, Empire, on the Roman Empire, thinking that they hold the final decision. No. It's in the hand of the Almighty God. Look at that word again. And look at the last line of chapter last line of chapter 9 that is verse 27 the last line and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate the word determined again it says the determination the decision the program the plan is in the hand of the almighty god that's why as a child of god you rest and you relax and you sit back and say whatever is happening you just watch the wind blowing and you watch the waves rising and you watch the sea roaring and you say that's not in the hand of Satan. God knows all about it. And that which has been determined will definitely be accomplished. Doesn't that give the believer peace of mind? Doesn't that give you joy and rest? And you're able to rest because you know, whatever is happening, that which has been determined will be played out, will be fulfilled. Now, as we look at verses 24 to 27, verse 24 gives you a general view. And then from verse 25, we we'll begin to see the details. Let's look at point one in verse 24. The advent and the dispensation of the Messiah, the Prince. Verse 24 again. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Whenever the Lord was talking to the children of Israel, if he wanted to tell them a secret, he would speak in what we call code language. Code language. Why? So that the gentle nations around will not understand. So that all the authors and the writers and the historians and the poets around of the gentile world, they will not understand. Because here he was talking to Daniel. And Daniel was a Jew. And Daniel was among the people of God. The people of Judah. And you know it says in that verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Talking about the Jews. And then it says upon thy people holy city, thy holy city, that's Jerusalem. And because the message was for the children of Israel, the people of Judah, he spoke in such a language that the other people, the Gentiles around, will not understand. But we understand because we are children of God. We are now the Israel of God. And because we are the Israel of God, he has given us understanding. When he says weeks, what does that mean? 70 weeks. Anytime the Lord was talking to the children of Israel, he made use of the word week. Actually, that means seven. Each day representing a year. Those gentle people, Babylonians and the Middle Persians, will not have understood that. They'll be looking for weeks and weeks and weeks. But uh, he understood. Daniel understood. Look at Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 6. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Only the children of Israel will understand that when it says 70 weeks, 70 sevens. It's talking about 70 sevens of years. That's for 90 years. Let's look at Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. We're looking at verse 34. And you'll see the same thing that God is saying. That whenever he was talking to the children of Israel, he'll speak in that coach language. 
the Canaanites will not understand, the Amorites will not understand, the Amalekites will not understand, they will not be able to calculate and say, okay, we know for Israel, this is going to happen at this time, this is going to happen at this time. No, they are blind to the program of God concerning Israel. In Numbers chapter 14, we're looking at verse 34. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days each day for a year. You see that talking to your children of Israel, this is private, this is between father and children, this is between the Almighty God and His chosen covenant people. Each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquity, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 9. As you look at Daniel chapter 9, you'll find that the 70 weeks are divided into three parts. Three parts, but not equal parts. Again, you need to understand that uh, God divided the three parts to three parts and says, the first part seven weeks. Seven sevens. That's seven times seven forty-nine years. And then it says the second part will be sixty and two. Three score and two. That is sixty-two weeks, sixty-two sevens. And that means again you multiply that and you have a yes again. And then if you add the seven and the sixty-two you have the sixty-nine. When you multiply that you have four hundred and sixty-three years. Then it says there's a last week. In that last week another prince will rise up. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 and it says after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. And then it says but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall arise that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood. The flood there just means the enemy the army of the enemy when the enemy shall rise as a flaw, the Spirit of God will raise up his standard against him. And unto the end thereof of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the last week. That's the last seven. Let us come back to you, verse 24 of uh, chapter 9. When Christ comes. For the first time, he has come already and is gone. But at the time of Daniel, he had not come. And the Lord was telling Daniel, he said, I know what you are asking about. You are asking about Babylonian captivity, about the deliverance of the children of Israel, the people of Judah out of Babylon to go to their land. That's all right, that's all right. I'll show you that. I'll give revelation on that. But let me talk about something more important, about the Messiah coming about Christ coming, about the Savior of the world coming. And then he says, what he will do when he comes. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And then when the Messiah comes, he'll be to finish transgression, number one, and to make an end of sins, number two, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, number three, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, number four, and then to seal up the vision and prophecy, number five, and then number six, to anoint the most holy. As we look at the coming of Christ, and when Christ comes, this is what you will do. You find the important thing that Christ will do when he comes, and the angel said that. He said what Jesus will do when he comes. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Let's back up to verse to verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Remember now, the person we are calling Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1 is called the Messiah. In Daniel chapter 9, the Messiah, the Christ, the same thing. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. And when he appeared to him in a dream, this is what he said, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not, for to take 
unto thee, and Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name, tell me, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. Well, that verse is uh, fulf the fulfillment of what was revealed unto Daniel. The Messiah is coming. Christ is coming. When he comes, number one, he will finish transgression. He'll bring transgression. He'll bring it to a final end. And then it says, he'll make an end of sins. That's the reason it's coming. And then he will, it will be to make reconciliation for iniquity. All those who have been in sin and their iniquities and transgressions and sins and evil have separated them from the Lord. He'll make reconciliation. Tell them that they can repent of their sins and then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be cleansed from their sins and be born again and be saved. And when they are saved, they are reconciled to the Heavenly Father and then they will bring in everlasting righteousness. Look at that verse 21 again. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, thou Joseph, thou Mary, Thou, the believer, when Jesus comes into your life, you will call him Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now we need to notice uh, that little word there, the little preposition there, from. From. From their sins. Many churches and many people who go to church and many people that carry this Bible, many people that read this Bible, they read it as if he shall save his people in their sins. That's the attitude of some people. They don't understand. He saves them from their sins. You'll find some uh, people who say they are believers. Oh, they say I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I've received Jesus Christ into my life. And now he has forgiven all my sins. He has saved me in my sins. What they mean is it doesn't matter what I do. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm saved. I can remain in sin. I am saved because they think that Jesus has come to save them in their sins let me on let me illustrate to you what they mean and look at how ridiculous that is we have a and we have b a says is born again b is not born again b is still committing sin he is in sin a is also committing the same sin that b is committing but a is saying although i'm doing the same thing that b is doing b is unfortunate B is unlucky because he is not born again, but me. I am born again. I am saved in my sins. He saying that God will judge B because he's not born again. God will not judge him because he is born again, but he's committing the same sin as the same sin as B is committing. And I say, wait a minute, analyze that. You say you have grace. He doesn't have grace. You say you have Jesus. He doesn't have Jesus. You say you have the promise of God. He doesn't have the promise of God. You say you are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. He is not cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And you are doing the same thing that he is doing. You have grace, he doesn't have. You have Jesus, he doesn't have. You have all the privileges, he doesn't have. And with all the privileges and the promises and the provision, you're still in the same sin that he is. And God will judge him and God will not judge you. No, he'll judge you more severely. The word there is not in. He doesn't save us in our sins. He saves us how? From our sins. Look at that again. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth his son. And I shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, tell me out loud, from their sins. Hey, let's look at that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that word from, from, from their sins, from their iniquity, from their transgression, from their evil. From, you notice that in the word of God. We're looking at Psalm 51, Psalm 51. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to finish transgression. 
He came to make an end of sins. He came to make reconciliation for iniquity. He came to bring in everlasting righteousness. Look at Psalm 51 and look at verse 2. Wash me thoroughly. What's the next word? From my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. It's not in sin. From. When it touches your life, it transforms you, it changes you. It takes you out of that sin and it brings you into righteousness. Let's look at Psalm 130. Psalm 130. And I'm reading there from verse 8. And you look for the word from. The word from. In Psalm 130 verse 8. And he shall redeem Israel. What's there? From all his iniquities. From. Never think that when God saves you and when God redeems you, He saves you and will remain there in the sin. It's from. He takes away the sin. He says, He shall redeem Israel from all His iniquity. Jeremiah chapter 33. In Jeremiah chapter 33, we're looking at verse 8. Jeremiah 33, verse 8. And I will cleanse them from all the iniquity. And you see how total it is. You see how complete it is. It doesn't allow to remain in sin. The moment you are born again. The moment Christ comes to your life. That's what God was telling um, Daniel through that angel. The Messiah is coming. Christ is coming. The Savior is coming. The final sacrifice for sin is coming. And when he comes as Messiah King. And as he comes as the Christ, the Lord. He comes as his final sacrifice. He saves the people people from their sins. Jeremiah 33 verse 8. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're looking for that word from. From. is from sin, not in sin. When you are saved, it takes you out of sin. If you are still in a sin, you're not born again. If you're still in a sin and you're still doing it like you did it before you are ever coming to said you are coming to the Lord, ever before you knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross. If you're still in that sin, whatever sin it is, you still need to come back and come to the Lord and say, Lord, now I understand why you came. You came to finish transgression. And you came to make an end of sins. And you came to make reconciliation for iniquity. You came to bring in everlasting righteousness. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 18. We're looking for the word from. From. From sin. Romans chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 18. Being then made free. Next words. From sin, from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. And but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. First John, first John chapter one. In first John chapter one, I'm reading from verse seven. From sin, from sin, from iniquity, from transgression, from evil, from corruption. In first John chapter one, verse seven. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, tell me the rest, cleanseth us from all sin. He saves us from our sin. That's what he came to do. And that's why the angel told Daniel, you know, Daniel, the Messiah is coming. And when he comes that first time, he's going to pay the price for our iniquity. And he's going to pay our punishment. And then he's going to take away our sin. Because he's going to, number one, finish transgression. You come to the Lord, you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I've committed sin against you. I merit judgment. And then I take Jesus Christ as my substitute. As the one that takes my sins away. And the moment you receive him like that, and thou shalt shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from 
their sins. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the false begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us. What follows? From our sins. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. You see then, as you look at all the scriptures, you know what Jesus has come to do? He has not come to save us in our sins, to remain in our sins. When he saves us, he changes our lives. He transforms us. He takes us away from the sin and takes the sin away from us. We're looking at Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus Chapter 2, and we're looking at verse, we're looking at verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, remember again the word from, from, from all your iniquity, from all your sin, from all your transgression. It saves us from sin. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. What next? From all iniquity, there we are. He, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 3, verse 26. From sin, from iniquity, from transgression. That's how it saves us. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning you, in turning away every one of you. What? For me, it's iniquity. So then we learn that Jesus Christ, as he came the first time, he came to finish transgression. He came to make an end of sin. And he came to make reconciliation for iniquity. He came to bring in everlasting righteousness. I come to point number two. Atonement through the death of Messiah the Prince. Atonement through the death of Messiah the Prince. He came to make atonement so that all our sins will be taken away and there will be no more present in our lives again. He comes to give us grace, the grace to live in righteousness. Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 24 again. Daniel 20, uh, chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. And as the Lord was revealing to Daniel that the Messiah will come, he said, there will be a time when the Messiah shall be cut off. Cut off. What does that mean? The Messiah being cut off. Let's come to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. By the way, the children of Israel missed this point when Christ came. They thought, when the Messiah comes, he'll deliver us from the Roman government. And then he'll set us free politically. They didn't know that Jesus Christ as the Messiah, when he comes, the very first time he comes, he'll be cut off. He'll be crucified. But Isaiah said that. Daniel said that. Zechariah said that they should have understood, but they didn't understand. Isaiah chapter 53. I'm reading there from verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is, when Christ comes the first time, that's what he will do. He will be our substitute. He will, he will pay the penalty for our sin. 
and all our sin with the guilt and the condemnation will be laid upon him. I, I wish the children of Israel had understood that. They wouldn't have rejected Christ the way they did because Jesus Christ was going to the cross, was going to die. That's why they didn't believe. That's why some of them were even saying, if you are the Christ, come down from the cross and we will believe you. No, he cannot come down from the cross. He's to be cut off. Is to be crucified. The very reason he came is so that that first time he came, he will be on the cross, he'll be crucified, he'll be cut off. And the iniquity of us all will be laid upon him. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet we, 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 he opened not his mouth. He was is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearer's is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was what? Cut up. That is it. He was cut up. That's his crucifixion. That's why he came. And we need to understand that Jesus died according to the plan of God, according to the program of God. That he was to sacrifice, make that final sacrifice. Why? To finish transgression. Why was he cut off to make an end of sins? Why was he cut off to make reconciliation for iniquity? Why was he cut off to bring in everlasting righteousness? That's why it says in that verse 8, it was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. That's, that's very clear. Out of the land of the living. That means to die for the transgression of my people was he stricken. That's why Daniel said he'll be cut off, but not for himself. But not for himself. Not for any sin he had committed. Not for any evil he had done. But he'll be cut off for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Uh, and as we look at that, you understand, that's exactly what the Bible says that he died because of our sins. In First Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Well then we understand the reason why Jesus came and the reason why he made that atonement is so that our sins will be taken away, our sins will be forgiven and cleansed and so that the end will come to our transgression. We will not continue that transgression. And so that the iniquity and the sins and the end will come to everything. And so that it will bring in everlasting righteousness into our lives. Romans chapter 5, we're reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, not for himself, not for himself. He didn't commit any sin. He didn't do any evil. He died for the ungodly. Verse 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for who? He died for you. He died for me. He died for us. And because he died for us, we shall live. We will not die again will not bear the punishment of our sins anymore because he's a savior, he's a redeemer, he's a substitute. He died for us in verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him because we are saved from sin, we are also saved from suffering, from wrath from damnation, from the judgment, from the consequence of sin. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, reconciled unto God. Do you remember why Jesus came? Number one is to finish transgression. Number two is to make an end of sin. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. And here's exactly what he's telling us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, 
but we also joy, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And that's why we titled that second point, Atonement Through the Death of Messiah the Prince. Let's come back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, and I'm reading there from verse 20, 25. Daniel chapter 9. As you look at Daniel chapter 9, you will see here what the Lord is saying, what the Lord says, He has come to do. Daniel chapter 9. Nine, and we're reading verse 25, verse 25. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the priest, shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. I want you to look at uh, a word there, actually, you have one word in the present and then past tense, is the word build, build. It says, to restore and to build, to restore and to build. And then the latter part of that verse, the street shall be built again. The street shall be built again. And the walls, even in troublous times. Again, here we need to understand that God was talking to Daniel. And Daniel was a Jew. And Daniel was of the descendant of Abraham. And he was telling the people of God through Daniel, he said, even though you might see troubles ahead, you've seen trouble, for example, in the Babylonian captivity, in the Middle Persian uh, captivity or the Babylonian uh, Babylonian. Uh, that Middle Persian kingdom, you'll find that there might still be suffering, and then the Grecian people will come, and then the Romans will come. Does that mean the building of Jerusalem will stop, and the building of the walls will stop, and the building of the streets will stop because of troublous times? It says, No, look at that verse again, verse 21, verse 25, rather, and the street shall be built again, built again, and the walls built again, even in troublous times. And because we are the Israel of God, we are the people of God now, we need to understand that even at the time of trouble, you will keep on building. Even at the time of trial, we keep on building. At the time of temptation and test, we keep on building. You see, there are some people that say, I'm going to wait. This troublous time. It's a trying time. And it's a testing time. And these are difficult, tough times. Nobody can build anything now. And so some people just leave up building anything because it is troublous times. Look at Amos chapter Amos chapter 9. I'm reading there from verse 11. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. We came here to study. And when you study, you're not just studying theory of what Daniel knew, what the children of Israel knew. You must know something for yourself. In Amos chapter 9, and we're looking at verse 11. We're talking about building now. You have something to build. You have a life to build. You have a home to build. You have the kingdom to build. And you have the ministry to build. You have the church to build. And even in troublous times, we'll keep on building your personal life. we we'll keep on building your home, your family. In troublous times, we we'll keep on building the ministry. In troublous times, we we'll keep on building the church. In troublous times, we we'll keep on developing and building everything the Lord has laid upon our hearts we ought to build. In Amos chapter 9, and we're looking at verse 11. It says, and in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David. Isn't that similar to what Daniel had said? That that is falling and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up the ruin, its ruins. And I will build it as in the days of old. That's exactly what God was telling Daniel. Daniel. The streets of Jerusalem will be built. Daniel, the walls of Jerusalem will be built when in troublous times. And here God says, I'll raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. I want you to understand that this prophecy here uh, tallies with Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Look at this. Acts chapter 15. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, we're reading there from verse 13. 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 15 verse 13. So you understand the application to the church of the living God. It says in Acts chapter 15 verse 13, And after they had held their peace, James and such same men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon has declared how God at the force did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Talking about the conversion of the house of Cornelius. The conversion of the Gentiles. Talking about evangelism. Talking about building the church, establishing the church. With all these converts that have been integrated into the church. He said Simeon, that's Peter, has declared how God at the force did visit the Gentiles to take out a people, to take out of them a people for his name. Then look at verse 15 and verse 16. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is falling down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will search it up. He quoted that from Amos chapter 9 verse 11. The building. And then when you link that up with Daniel, it says, even in troublous times, the building goes on. God is going to build the ruined places. And here the New Testament believers, they emphasize this and they related it to evangelization. And to the building of the church. Upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What are we learning? In trying times, keep on building. Building the church. In difficult times, keep on building. Building the church. In troublous times, keep on building. Building the church. Uh, let's look at this now. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Don't ever, don't ever say, because of, you, maybe you are passing through some trials, and you are passing through some tests, you are passing through some tough times, and you are passing through some troublous times. Therefore you say, I cannot work for God now. I cannot evangelize now. I cannot preach now because we're passing through troublous times. Even in those troublous times, we build. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee, thou art, thou art Peter, that and upon this rock I will do what? I will build my church in those troublous times, keep on building, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Romans chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 19 and verse 20. Romans chapter 15, verse 19, verse 20, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem to round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul the Apostle, when he spoke about preaching the gospel of Christ, hear what it says, he, really, he relates it to buildings. Yeah, yeah. So, I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build, build upon another man's foundation. He counted evangelism as building. You are bringing in converts. Those are lively stones that are built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep on building. In First Corinthians chapter 3, in troublous times, testing times, in trying times, when there are trials and difficulties and tough times, you keep on doing the work of God. First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon. Have you noticed the life of Paul the Apostle? Trials, temptations, trouble, persecution, shipwreck, and was confronted by those great, great enemies, the Sanhedrin, and they imprisoned him. Yet in those troublous times, he kept on building, evangelizing. Do the same thing in your life. Don't ever say, because of what you are going through, because of what the challenges facing your life, because of that you cannot do what the Lord has called you to do. You keep on evangelizing, preaching the gospel up to every creature. And then he says over there, but uh, let every man take care what he buildeth thereupon. Then he says in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man 
built upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. If any man's work shall abide, which he has built thereupon. You see the work we're doing? Every work we do for the Lord is like we are building. But then you're not just building the church, you're building your personal life, your personal life. And in times of temptation, you wouldn't stop building your Christian life, your personal life, your holy life, your righteous life. You know some people, they stop making personal progress, personal development, personal building of their spiritual lives. Whenever there is any little trial or temptation or trouble, oh, they say, these are trying times. These are difficult times. And because it's troublous times, I cannot do anything now. You know, I used to read the Bible. I used to go to Bible study. I used to develop myself. But these are trying times. That's the time to keep on building. Look at Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 24, verse 25. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Your personal life is like building. It's like you're building a house upon the rock. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon the rock. You're building your personal life. And then it says, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and, and the winds blew. Those are troublous times, troublous times. And beat upon that house, and it fell not, because it was built and founded upon the rock. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, we're looking at verse 32. The development of your Christian life, of your personal life, is like you're building. And in those troublous times, trying times, testing times, tough times, you keep on building that life. Don't ever give it up. Every day you build something fresh, something new, something higher, something greater than you were before. Acts chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that which is able to build you up. Difficult times, take to the word. Drink in the word. Soak in the word. Because it is that word that keeps on building you up at that difficult, tough, troublous times. And to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified, judged, Verse 21, Jude, that's only one chapter. And there we're looking at verse 21. It says, verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in the most holy faith. Troublous times, building up yourself. Times of temptation, keep on building up yourself. You know why some people fall to temptation? You know why some people backslide during the times of difficulty? Because they allow the difficulty and the toughness of the time and the trial of the time and the trouble of the time to take the Bible away from them. To take Bible study away from them. To take praying time away from them. And to take spiritual, personal development away from them. They say, I cannot pray now. I'm going through trouble. I cannot read the Bible now. I'm going through some tough times. I cannot study the Bible. I cannot go to Bible study. Now, if you knew what I was going through, you'll not invite me to Bible study. That's the time to come to Bible study. Troublous times. When you keep on building. Look at that again. It says, ye beloved... Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Not only that, you build your home, build your home. And you know, there are some husbands, there are some wives, some fathers, some mothers. When, they, when everything is peaceful, they, they are very happy. And the husband is building the home. And the wife is building the home. But let trials strike. Let some trouble come. Then the wife will just hang down her hand. Why are you not doing something to build your home? 
to encourage your husband and to encourage your children and to make sure that the family is moving forward. I cannot do that now. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. A lot of trouble. And these are troublous times. I cannot build. Now when the trouble is over, then I will build. No. It is during that difficult time that you will say you need to build your home. You need to build your family. You'll not say because you know some people, if they are men, they, they, keep, they take to, maybe if they are unbelievers, they take to drinking. They want to drown their sorrow in drinking. And they just abandon their home. And, they, and they, they go to nightclubs and they go to hotels and they go to restaurants and go and eat. They don't come home because of troublous times. And some wives, they'll take over time in the place of work. Deliberately, they'll just run away from home. They don't know that it is at that troublous time, you need to stay at home. Husband and wife and children and parents. And build the home at that time. We're looking at, uh, at Proverbs Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth a house. Every wise woman buildeth a house. That troublous time, difficult time, dangerous time, that time when times are tough and things are difficult, is when to stay at home and build that home. We're coming to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, we come to point number 3. Abomination of desolation by the monster prince. We're looking at Daniel. I'm reading from the latter part of verse 26. Daniel chapter 9. The latter part of verse 26. It says in the latter part, and the people of the prince that shall come. The people of the prince that shall come. Here is another prince now. This is not the Messiah. This prince is distinguished. And is, uh, is very different from the Messiah. That prince that shall come shall destroy the city. Jesus didn't come to destroy. So you know this is not talking about Jesus. And it shall destroy the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the world desolations are determined. And he shall confirm that is the prince that shall come. The monster prince. The antichrist. He shall destroy. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week in the middle of the week then it says they shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate here the Lord is telling us that the time is coming when the antichrist will come and this will be the time of the great tribulation the Lord Jesus Christ has given us the interpretation of this in Matthew chapter 24. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. And we're reading there from verse 15. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Let's see what Christ himself has said. Interpreting Daniel chapter 9 for us. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. That's exactly the language of Daniel. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That's what Jesus said. Jesus recognized Daniel as a prophet. And he also recognized the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And he said, when you see that desolation, that abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him do what? understand. There's some people that don't understand. They don't understand that this is talking about the time of the great tribulation. Look at verse 21. For there shall be great tribulation. That's what Jesus said. That that last part of Daniel's prophecy is referring to the time of the great tribulation. For there shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world until unto this time no nor ever shall be. And when that one comes, first of all, he'll come into covenant with the children of Israel. And when he comes to that covenant, the children of Israel will see that now peace has come. Now they're going to have the time of prosperity. But in the middle of that week, remember the week is seven. And that means seven years. The time of the tribulation is seven years. In the middle of that, that's three and a half years. The latter part of the seven years will be three and a half years of great, great, great tribulation upon the people. 
And then the Lord said, Whosoever reads, let him understand. Come back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. It says in the latter part of verse 26, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. There will be great destruction. There will be great devastation. When the Antichrist, when he comes, he'll destroy the city, that's Jerusalem. And he'll destroy the sanctuary, that's the temple of the people of the Jews. He'll try to confirm the covenant with them for seven years. But then in the middle of the seven years, he'll break that covenant. And then he'll really torment those children of Israel in a very terrible way. What lesson are we learning from that? Well, there are a lot of lessons. Number one, let's look at Luke chapter 21 verse 36. Luke chapter 21. We're reading from verse 36. It says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all this sin that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. It says, Watch. Watch over your life. And watch over your Christian experience. You are born again. Watch over that. And you are sanctified. Watch over that. And the Lord has given you the grace to be holy, to be righteous. Watch over that. And live in that righteousness and holiness every day of your life. So that when that time will come, by the grace of God, you will not be here. When the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive will be caught up together with them. You'll take part in that rapture. I'll be there. You will be there. But we need to watch. That's what Jesus says. So that you'll be able to escape what is coming upon the world. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 in that verse 26. Daniel chapter 9 verse 26. And the people, that's in the middle of verse 26, and the people of the prince that shall come, shall do what? Shall destroy the city. Shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. You know what we are thinking about now from that verse? All the kingdoms of this world. And all that the Babylonians built. The Middle Persians, all that they built. And all that the Grecians built. All that the Romans built. Even all that those children of Israel, all that they built, even their city and their sanctuary, everything will be destroyed. But there is a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Look at this. There is one, there is two. One, this one, not the people of the world, they're spending all their energy, all their resources, and building and building and building. And everybody is concentrating on that. They are building what will eventually be destroyed. But here is number two on the other side. There is a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Never be destroyed. And if you are wise, you will not spend all your time, all your resources, all your skill, everything you have, developing the world that will be destroyed. Helping the people of the world to build and to raise up the thing that the Antichrist will soon come and destroy, devastate everything. You'll be concentrating on that which will never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 44. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. And in the days of this king shall, uh, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. God is setting up the kingdom. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of grace and the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which shall never be destroyed. How wise are you? What are you spending your time on? What are you spending your resources on? Are you spending your time, your resources on building the world and building the kingdoms of the world and building it for them? When there is another kingdom, the kingdom of God, you could get involved with and build that which will never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 26. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. How wise are you? All those things of the world that the people are building, the Antichrist is coming. And when he comes, he's going to destroy, devastate everything. But there is one. The kingdom of God is here already. 
and the kingdom of heaven is here already and the kingdom of Christ is here already and that's why we're evangelizing that's why we're preaching so that as people are coming to the kingdom we're building the kingdom of Christ and if you are not involved in that and you're involved in the thing that will be destroyed how wise are you Daniel chapter 7 verse 14 Daniel chapter 7 verse 14 it says and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all people and nations and languages shall serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed that's why the spirit of god is calling us to wisdom and the spirit of god is saying all these things that you see not one stone will be left upon another everything is going to be destroyed but there's a kingdom which shall not be destroyed get involved with that and join us to build this kingdom we're looking at luke chapter 9 verse 60 luke chapter 9 verse 60 luke chapter 9 verse 60 what you need to spend your time on, your money on, your skill on, your understanding, your intelligence, all the resources you've got. What you need to spend your energy on, building that kingdom which shall never be destroyed. In Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 16. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and do what? And preach the kingdom of God. That's the calling we have now. Go, preach the kingdom of God. I pray you will do it. I said you will do it. And the reward will be ours forever and ever in Jesus' name. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Is your love getting cold? I said, is your love getting cold? We're building the kingdom. And we don't have much time because Christ is about to come. And when we are gone, then the Antichrist will take over. And everything the people of the world are building now, raising up now, the Antichrist will just level everything, destroy. Before their eyes, it'll torture them. They must take the mark of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. And then while doing that, everything they built up, it leveled them and destroy them. But we would have gone. We'll be rejoicing with God in heaven. And if you're going to go with the people of God, your love must not wax cold. These troublous times, trying times, testing times, you must not allow your love to get cold. Verse 14, and then it, and verse 13, and he that shall endure unto the end. He that shall endure unto the end. Who is that? That's me. That's me. I said, who is that? That's you. God bless you. And he that shall, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14 now, and this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. Will we join our hands together with the Lord Jesus Christ and build the kingdom at this time? Will you do that? Let's rise up and tell the Lord, we're not going to waste all our lives and all our resources, all our time, building what the Antichrist will eventually come and destroy. We're going to walk with the Lord, walk us together with God, labor us together with God, build us together with God. We're building a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. We we'll see what the Lord himself has revealed unto us. I will see what the Lord is challenging us to do. Daniel prayed. It wasn't a selfish prayer. It was a prayer that was concerned for the nation. Prayer that was concerned for the people of God. And because he prayed according to the word of God, according to the will of God, relying on the faithfulness of God, the Lord answered speedily. Why don't you pray like that? You pray for sinners to be born again. Pray for the church to be strong. Pray for the believers to lay their hands on the plow and never look back. Pray for us to bring all our resources together, join our resources together, our minds, our heart, our money, everything we've got, and build the kingdom at this time. Getting so saved. Getting believers, new converts, integrated with the church. 
making those who are saved to seek after holiness, peace, sanctification, purity of heart. Let the fire burn in your soul. Passion, desire, earnestness, pursuing the goal of seeing the kingdom of God exalted, developed, built. Daniel was greatly beloved because he remained in holiness, in righteousness, in purity. That great man of God, great prophet of God, Daniel, he never backslid. He never backslid. Some people plotted against his life. He never backslid. They set up an edict that he should not pray. He never backslid. They threw him into the lion's den. He never gave up. The persecutors, the enemies of progress and righteousness rose up against him. No, he never backslid. That's why he was a great man of God. Greatly beloved. On the other hand, you remember Solomon? Beloved of God. But the flesh, the lust of the flesh, did not allow him to remain. Beloved of God, Outland, outlandish women caused him to sin. Pray that that will not happen to you, my brother. Pray that that will not happen to you, my sister. As the Lord has invited you into the kingdom, has called you into the kingdom, you're a child of God, beloved of the Lord. Pray. That God will help you to remain a beloved of God. Saved, separated from the world, sanctified, holy, filled with the Holy Ghost. Having the favor of God in your life, beloved of God. Remaining constant, consistent, serving the Lord. Pure in heart, purposeful. Then I'll purpose in a search. Do not drink of the wine of the king. He will not defile himself with the wine of the king. Have the same heart. Have the same goal. You know why Christ came, the Messiah? He came to finish transgression. Why don't you pray and say, Lord, finish it up in my life. Don't allow any transgression to remain. Finish it. No sin, no evil, no iniquity. He came to finish transgression. If you know the Lord, that's what you will do. If you have come to the Lord, that's what you will do. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's what He does. He came to finish, finish transgression. To make an end of sin. So you will not say, that's my weakness. I'm always falling into that. That's my weakness. No. Came to make an end of sin. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciling us unto God. No wall of barrier. No wall of separation. No wall of demarcation. Between us and the Lord anymore. Reconciled. Then he brings in everlasting righteousness to make us holy and righteous all the days of our lives. All the days of our lives. Not righteous yesterday and sinful today. Not righteous today and falling into sin tomorrow. 
Christ came to bring in everlasting righteousness. You're born again, there'll be righteousness. You're a child of God, there'll be righteousness. You have known Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, is your substitute, is your Redeemer, and is living on the inside of you. Give Him chance, give Him the liberty to live that righteousness, that holiness through your life. Everlasting righteousness saves us from sin, from iniquity. Not in sin. Can you remain in sin and say the grace of God shall abound? God forbid. He came to save us from sin. To take away our sin. Some church goers who do not understand the mission of Christ. After they say they are born again. They are even committing more sin. And before the time, they said he came to know the Lord. If you have come to know the Lord, he came to save us from sin. And whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. But the seed of God remains, abides in him. And he cannot sin. He doesn't have the desire to. Cannot sin. Because he's born of God. Herein are the children of God manifested. And the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. If you are born again. Christ lives on the inside of you. He makes all things new. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And when Christ is living unhindered in our lives, we'll keep on building. You'll be building a righteous life, a holy life, a stable life, even in troublous times, even in trying times, even in difficult times, in tough times, you'll keep on building. Build your life upon the word of God. And you'll keep on building your home in difficult times, trying times, tough times. you keep on building your family. Husband, wife, father, mother, don't run away from home because there's trouble. Don't go outside trying to get solace, support, comfort from outsiders. Stay home, at home. Build that home in troublous times. And church, build the church in troublous times. Leaders, pastors, overseers, workers, in troublous times, challenging times, difficult times, that's when to stay. Stay with the workers and stay with the leaders and stay with the members and stay with the members of the church. Build in troublous times. That's when to plan programs. That's when to evangelize. That's when to disciple and keep on building. In troublous times. The very last week of Daniel's prophecy. The last seven years. The last three and a half years in particular will be the time of the great tribulation. That Antichrist will come. He will destroy both the city and the sanctuary. The wise don't spend all your life building up was going to be destroyed by the Antichrist. But there's a kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of grace, the kingdom of righteousness, the kingdom that shall never be destroyed.